Good morning and welcome to Chris & Co with me, Chris Price, a new show looking at what affects business in Kent. Joining me today are Joe James, Chief Executive of Kent Invicta Chamber of Commerce and Rick Schofield, a tax partner at Accountants Wilkins Kennedy. They'll be discussing topics like the impact of the national living wage, which came into force this month. And we'll also throw in a question about the forthcoming EU referendum. First today, though, we're talking about the dark and murky world of corporate tax avoidance. The issue of companies using complex arrangements and offshore havens to avoid paying tax has become a hot topic this year, with many questioning its morality. Our reporter Henry Sandercock went to Maystone to find out more. 2016 has been the year of tax avoidance. The release of the Panama Papers and revelations about the tax affairs of large multinational corporations like Amazon, Google and Starbucks have led to widespread condemnation across the globe. Tax avoidance is a perfectly legal way of reducing the amount of money that a company or an individual has to pay towards a certain country's tax system. But how does it all work? Large corporations operate through many different companies. They have a choice about where to put those companies. They can place them in different countries. And um, all the countries of the world have different tax regimes. And so groups are able to choose which countries they uh, trade in and uh, therefore which tax rate they pay. Clearly, companies have a fairly easy ride when it comes to avoiding tax, but what do consumers think? Well, the simple reason is, chuck them out of the country. <laughs> I've had enough of paying tax. I think it's terrible, because I've, I've retired and I'm still paying £90 tax, believe it or not, after 42 years' work. What's your opinion of companies that avoid tax? Very bad. Very bad. There should be one rule for one and one for all the others. I think if you live here, you should contribute to everything. The recent disclosures about the tax affairs of the rich and famous will only put more pressure on governments around the world to do more to combat tax avoidance. This is Henry Sandercock for KMTV. So, Rick Schofield, you've worked on the tax arrangements of FTSE 100 companies in your career. Are the measures they're taking to avoid tax fair? When you look at the very big businesses, they see tax as a cost. Same as payroll, same as cost of goods, they look at it as a cost. So they do what they can legally to manage that cost. Sure. Now, the Googles of the world, yes, they are putting some profit in an overseas jurisdiction where the tax is lower. But to do that, you've actually got to move the risk there. So you've actually got to have people there. That feels reasonable. There are some people out there who have, shall we say, more artificial schemes, paper schemes, where it's just sign this piece of paper, sign that piece of paper, and hey, there's tax loss has appeared. That doesn't feel right. And tax avoidance is a very broad spectrum, from nipping across the channel to buy some you know, cheaper wine to some very structured schemes. It's a spectrum. There is a bit of that spectrum I, I feel uncomfortable with, and there's bits we feel more comfortable with. Joe. Let me, throw, let me throw this to you. Um, you represent thousands of businesses in Kent, uh, many of which will not have the resources to, kind out, to carry out this kind of avoidance. Um, what do they think of the actions of the, you know, the Google, Starbucks of this world? Well, I mean, tax avoidance is, you know, it's a very complex issue. And, um, you know, they're very confused by it all and actually angered in some ways and unfair competition. Um, but I think actually there's a job here for the government. And I think the government really should look at doing a wholesale simplification of our tax system. So actually we all know where we stand. Um, and, and if they do that, um, you know, we're going to know what we've got to pay, what we've not got to pay. Um, it's just going to be so much simpler for everybody concerned. So, you know, it is frustrating when everybody pays their dues. But actually, if there's loopholes there, um, businesses will exploit them. They're not illegal. Um, they're there. And if the government wants to do something about it, then it needs to start clamping down on those loopholes. Um, these businesses, as you say, they're all commercial operations. They're all trying to make a profit so they can hire better staff, make more profits, so that they, you know, hire more better staff and again and again do more innovation. I mean, I suppose um, if your business has the ability to pay less tax, you're going to do it. Is that is that the right way to? Um, it, it's, to it's certainly the way that people think about it. Certainly, if you're sitting there as a director of a PLC and you've got shareholders to think about, you've got staff to think about. Yes, that's the way you think about it. 
if it's your own business, then perhaps you may start thinking, well, is it the right thing to do? Well, getting into tax and ethics is, is a dangerous game because then you start getting into spending and ethics and it, it, it's a bit more murky. So talking about the ethics of it then, whose uh, responsibility is it then to make sure that companies are paying the tax that they should be paying? Is it HMRC? Is it the companies? It's the, the taxpayer has the responsibility to pay what they believe is the correct amount of tax and the revenue has the responsibility to check that and make sure they're paying the correct amount of tax. And as long as that's the way it is, it's fine. It's when you get the revenue, say, stretching what they think is the correct amount of tax to the maximum amount of tax. And that's where there, there does have to be this, this two-way street. Um, the, jo, I mean, do you well, think I think we need, to, we need to have clear, fair guidelines as businesses, you know. Um, you know, particularly small businesses. If you look at Kent, it's nearly 90% of us employ under 10. So when we're looking at small businesses, we need very clear guidelines. Um, and let's just be honest, you know, who doesn't try to get down their tax bill? You know, we all, we're, we're all, good, you know, all good companies, we all want to pay into the system, but actually who wants to, to, to overpay? Who wants to pay exactly what their dues is worth? And that's most, most businesses. And you think small businesses would be doing, you know, if, if a small business had the, the knowledge, the, the insight into how to make money work from that way, do you think all small businesses would be taking advantage of the same loopholes? Well, the businesses, you know, we all, we all need to keep our money to invest, to employ, employ more people. We all want to pay our taxes, we all want to do the legal things. But all I'm saying, if there's opportunities out there uh, where actually we can legally reduce our tax bills, um, it's not immoral, then actually then what business wouldn't look um, at, at doing it? But it's where the government needs to really, um, you know, have 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 some responsibility here you know we need clear guidelines and you know, ever gone on to HMRC website and look at tax and you know and corporation tax and and all the dues that you know businesses have to pay it's like a minefield so you know please government wants to do something about it for small businesses simplification's got to be the word okay thanks very much to you both on that topic moving on then a big change to nearly all businesses has been the introduction of the national living wage this month. It's been a real boost to the income of lower earners, but many bosses are concerned it's squeezing the margins and saying it's forcing them to make cutbacks. Our reporter Holly Payne spoke to businesses in sectors most affected. This farm in West Kent has been producing salad and cereal for more than 80 years. Right now, business is flourishing. But like other farming industries, the rise in the national living wage from £6.70 to £7.20 for the over 25s means its future may become less certain. People in British society have to have a base rate of, of, of earnings that allow them to function within British society. But the, the horticultural industry isn't quite that scenario. So it's bad for us and it's bad for a lot of other vegetable growers as well but it's even worse for a lot of the soft fruit growers. I think it'll be a long-term death. It's not just farming that's going to be affected over the coming years, but also the care industries, as well as the hospitality industries. By 2020, this farm's increased wage bill could top half a million pounds. That's if George Osborne's plan for a nine pound minimum wage comes into force. But are most people not set to benefit? I, I always welcome the fact of the minimum wage going up, but that should be done in consultation with both trade unions and also uh, industry experts. What I am concerned about in some cases, some of the big employers across the country are cutting back on staff perks. So I think that's the wrong approach to take. So when you see supermarkets saying you're not going to have your free meals anymore or well-known cafes, I think they can afford those perks and this is just an excuse. Holly Payne reporting for KMTV. So, Joe James, businesses are using the minimum wage as an excuse to make cutbacks. What do you say to that? Um, I don't think most of the businesses that I deal with actually are looking at it as an excuse to, to make cutbacks and actually that's not the way it should be viewed. Um, but actually talking on behalf of businesses, particularly small businesses, well not just small businesses, those um, in the farming sector, those in retail, those in leisures, I do have quite a concern. Um, 
at the time that you know we, we've got this huge increase in the minimum wage at the same time businesses are also uh, can have the impact of auto enrollment um, and that's a real challenge particularly for the sectors that are used to um, having the, the, the lower pay um, it's going to have quite an impact at the same time as auto enrollment but to me my big concern isn't so much as the introduction uh, we've got this year but actually by 2020 it's got to go up to nine pounds uh, that's a big increase year on year and when you look over the last few years you know people have been giving maybe if they have been giving salary increases it's been one percent two percent this is going to be quite a jump um, so it's not just looking at the, the lower scale you know you've got to start then looking at differentials because if your lower paid workers are going to be on nine pounds an hour obviously that's got to, to go on up up through the business so actually it's a huge cost also at the same time we've got the uh, the minimum wage you know slowly increasing increasing up auto enrollment um, coming up one percent two percent three percent um, huge impact particularly on small businesses and you know two th since 2008 it has been tight it has been tight and I think most businesses have actually cut their overheads down to the minimum and the biggest thing that we all have as small businesses now are our staffing bills um, and suddenly you lump all these the government lumps all these extra costs on small business there isn't much more that can go and I do hope that it's not done at the expense of people. Rick, um, companies face nine pounds an hour minimum wage potentially by 2020. Yep. What what can they do to try and maybe mitigate some of that, that those higher costs? We, we're going to have to pay those costs. So what you've got to do is make those people more valuable to you. Uh, I think it's worth investing in people's training. You, know, you can get a person if you can make that person better by investing in the training. They become worth nine pound twenty five an hour or ten pounds an hour. I think if you do that it becomes less of a problem. Um, we heard there are companies that are in the care industries, hospitality, the rural sector. Which sector do you think is taking the biggest hit from rises in the, the national living wage? I would probably say it's probably uh, in our farming community. I would probably say it's agriculture that's probably going to take the, uh, the biggest hit. Because of the just the relying on Eastern European migrants to pick that kind of thing. Yeah, that yeah, that's what it is. It's the nature of the job that's involved. It's normally sort of um, you know minimum wage and on la large scales. Um, so I think they will probably be the ones that'll be harder hit. Okay, thanks to you both for your thoughts on that issue. Mm -hmm. Thank um, one. We we can't let today go by without a quick question on one of the big topics affecting everything to do with business right now, and that is the EU referendum. Um, Joe, maybe I'll start with you quickly. Uh, what do you think um, the mood is among among businesses? What do you think is going to sway potential potential voters? What are the concerns that they have? Well, it's interesting. We've done a few surveys on this uh, with members, um, and actually, if they if they vote with their business hat on, um, particularly those that export. Actually, before um, you know, before David Cameron even went to look at renegotiations, it made no difference for them. For trade perspective they could see that actually we had to be in Europe and it didn't matter um, what those trade agreements that he'd managed to, to, to negotiate um, we had to be in Europe but actually as the time has gone on um, things are, are slightly starting to sway and I think it's very confusing um, you've got two different camps giving totally different uh, different opinions on the same subject and and actually it's very confusing and my concern with this is that businesses and individuals um, aren't going to have the right knowledge to make the right decision and this is a decision for the country as a whole and so therefore us as businesses and everybody as individuals need to have the information to make that right decision otherwise people will vote in what's in it for me and actually if you're looking at your own personal circumstance it's not for the overall good of the country. Rick, do you feel like you understand the issues that are going to, uh, you know, affect the vote? To be honest, no. Um, uh, it, it is it is very confusing and a very complex issue. It's not just well, is it migration? Is it trade? There's whole sorts of things tied in there in terms of NHS, reciprocal agreements with Spain. What happens if you're on holiday and something happens to you? It, it, it's a lot more complex than perhaps it's been portrayed. Having said that, I wish they just get on and 
have the vote because at the minute we're all sitting here not sure what's going on and that isn't good for us either. And of course we'll, we'll just quickly wrap up today. Our final, final, last, last question uh, <laughs> to you both on BHS which we're hearing as fallen into administration. Uh, it's been troubled for a long time. Jo, are, are you, have you shopped in BHS at all? In I the have last? been in, I have been in there. Um, yeah, a real disappointment, a real disappointment. Uh, the disappointment being that, you know, we seem to have over the last few years an ever-changing high street. Um, and slowly, one by one, you know, the main stores are, are actually going. Um, but then, you've, you know, why is this happening? You know, I as a shopper, and I'm quite an ardent shopper, you know, our trends are changing. Um, and we need to, you know, we, we've got busier lives, we shop online, so stores need to change and adapt to, uh, to their consumer shopping habits. And that's what hasn't happened with BHS, which is a great shame. Rick, will you miss it? Personally, no, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do a huge amount of shopping. But it's just a shame that another historic British name is disappearing from the high street and yeah. most of the high streets are getting very similar. It's a shame it's gone. Okay, um, I think it's a story that will run and run for a long time. I think it's, it's potentially the, the biggest exit since Woolworths from the high street, isn't it, 2008? We all remember what that was like um, yeah. and all the, the sadness of people queuing up for their final pick and mix kind of thing. <laughs> um, We'll, um, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see what happens there. But that's it, unfortunately, for the first edition of Chris & Co, our new show looking at the issues affecting businesses in Kent. You can keep up to date with all the county's latest business news at kentbusiness.co.uk. But for now, I'll say that's it. Thanks for watching. Have a good day.